Hey, how's it going guys? Uh, Brad the Guitologist here. Uh, in today's video, we're going to look at the pile and we're going to see the dates and everything when sh was shipped to me and I'm going to pick out the one that was the oldest and we're going to get to work on it. Uh, I've also got a couple things over here that uh, appear to be viewer mail. Uh, those two there on top are viewer mail and then that one right there, that little FedEx package is from Korg. So what could that be from Korg? We will open that at some point, probably not in this video. Uh, I'll also do probably another video, the separate one, I'm sure, opening some viewer mail. Uh, but in this one, we're going to open one of these larger packages and figure out uh, which one is, like I said, <laughs> I've had the longest because I've been sick, so I'm trying to catch up with this stuff. Uh, also got uh, some stuff hung up, kind of trying to decorate my little space down here. I've got my uh, strap collection all hung up which I think looks kind of cool. Um, got a couple posters and things hung up. Just trying to sp spruce the place up a bit. Uh, trying to clean up things. I had some work done down here. Um, this whole wall was empty. There was no insulation in it at all, so it was really drafty down here. You could actually stick your hand up in these light sockets and feel air just pouring in from outside like real, you know freezing air so I had a bunch of work done down here and um, had this whole wall shot full of cellulose insulation all the way up to the top and it's way better down here a lot more comfortable a um, lot more of a joyous place to be in now <laughs> you can actually stand it so excited about that and excited about what we're gonna open so let's uh, let's choose one of these and get to work Okay, so those three larger ones back there are from January 3rd and January 4th. This one came to me on December 29th. So we're going to open this one. It's the uh, one I've had the longest. And we'll see what it is and repair whatever it is. And I think this thing was officially packed by FedEx. Uh, so this, is, this will give us a chance to see how FedEx packs their stuff. Um, at least I'm pretty sure this is FedEx um, because it's all FedEx taped and everything so I'm sure they probably did this packing so that looks pretty good so far and then we've got some of this stuff that's good stuff that's kind of like a memory foam kind of crap it kind of conforms to whatever you press it on to and we're double boxed so that's that's good that's uh, I mean this is if you really want something to survive a shipment, um, double boxing like this with with an internal box and then all this stuff around it the way that that was, I mean, that's really your best bet. Uh, so let's get this other box out and open it. Okay, here's the internal box and it is it is packaged all around as well. You see good foam on top there, foam all around. Um, okay, this is a... Uh, this is from Gary Holcomb. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure Gary won't mind me mentioning his name. Um, a viewer to the channel. Uh, looks like we got some something's in this bag. I think that might be tubes. Perhaps Let's set that aside. Um, on on it's in a situation like this, um, if you think about it. If you've got this big amplifier kind of rattling, I mean, it really couldn't move very much, so they were probably okay, but you've got to be careful with that packaging tube separately. Um, because if you think about it, if you're packaging them besides something like this that might be able to move back and forth, you might risk damaging them actually uh, more so than if you just left them in the amp a lot of times. Now, that might not be the case here. It looks like he's packed it so this really wouldn't move but you just gotta be careful about that but this is probably one of the best packaging jobs you know you'll you'll see um, there's just stuff you know it's double box there's stuff all all around everything on the internal and external box um, and there's just no way that this thing is gonna be broken you know like that when it's like that the only thing it really could happen is if you don't if you don't stuff enough stuff inside of one of these um, sometimes you get transformers that can kind of bend on you. The mounts will bend because the transformers are so heavy. Um, but this is going to be one of these old PAs, I think. I think I remember our conversation about this. This is an old, uh, yeah, this is an old Lafayette. PA 645A. 
So, what we're going to do on this is we're going to um, basically convert this into a guitar amp. And this is going to be a fun one. We have uh, a couple inputs for microphones. We have an auxiliary one and two. And this auxiliary, you know, this, this turns up like auxiliary one, and then it turns up auxiliary two if you go this way. Um, so this would be like if you had, you know, uh, if you wanted to fade between two things, like have two um, turntables or something, or a turntable and a tape or some, or two tape decks or something like that. You know, you could fade, oh, this song is on now, and this person is singing, you know, and then you fade over to this, and then this person's no longer singing, and you can fade this one up. So you can kind of do like a, you know, a little talent show or something with something like this back in the day. Uh, master volume, uh, bass and treble, on-off switch with a power light, and we have an anti-feedback killer option up here. That probably does, uh, probably inserts a cap, I would imagine. That kills some highs um, or shapes the tone in some way. Um, we may or may not keep that or repurpose the switch for something else, perhaps. Who knows? Um, but so far, it looks like looks like we're missing a cap can right there, maybe, um, or something. Maybe a cap can was replaced. There's, well, there's a couple cans back there, though. Not sure what would it, maybe nothing was installed there from the factory. Looks like we got a 6AV6 socket. Uh, we have a 12AX7 socket. And another 12AX7 here and over here. Over here we have uh, GZ34 rectifier and a couple of power tube slots that are not labeled. And I'm assuming those are probably 6V6. Uh, it looks like this has already been somewhat converted um, because these are most likely new. I doubt this would have had quarter inch inputs originally. Um, our auxiliaries are, are RCA and uh, I have an auxiliary uh, power there. Let's see, I don't know what this is. Oh, that's a standby switch. Somebody has probably installed that too, looks like. It's not original. We have a 3 amp fuse. And we have um, multi selector for 4, uh, 4, 8, 16, 20, uh, is that 25 ohms? 70 ohms. And there's the common. But they have this hooked up and they probably are using this as a selector so a lot of the work has already kind of been done here so this shouldn't be di too difficult uh, there's our big power transformer back there in the back it's it's short and squat but it's um it's got a large footprint and this would be the output transformer here good size i would expect uh, good things out of this amp just by looking at it looks like it's got pretty good bones let's get it up on the bench and uh, see what needs to be done. We'll also check the box and make sure there's nothing else left in there. I'm sure those are the tubes. So, yeah, let's get it all up on the bench. Okay, here's the message uh, that I got from Gary about this amp. Um, and it says, yeah, he already he's the one who put the jacks in it so he could play guitar. And he replaced all the tubes and cleaned out the pots. And it worked for a while. Uh, but now it will play for a few minutes and then no output. Um, so that's where we are. It'll play for a few minutes and no output. So that tells me something, I don't know, it could be a number of things. It could be a bias issue. It could be, uh, something in the power supply. It could be a, um, uh, it could be a matter of a, com you know, the thing heating up and then a component failing because it's, you know, heated up, maybe getting a poor connection perhaps. Um, so we'll have to kind of just go through and see what it's doing and why it's dropping out. All right, here's this thing up on the bench, and um, looks like we've got to get looks like we've got to get a couple of screws out here and here to get uh, this top panel off.
All right, now it should now it should slide out. Yeah, there we go. Should being the operative word there. Uh, it looks like these feet are. Is it going to be able to slide out with these feet on like this? Maybe I got to take the feet off too. I think I do. These feet might have been added later. I don't know. They're, they're mismatched, and they've got mismatched screws. So I think he may have added these feet too. This is constructed kind of like uh, some of the late '60s Bogan uh, amplifiers are constructed. If you look at, if you look those up, they're done in a very similar way um, with this outer shell like this, and they slide out the back. Uh, Precision Electronics also made some amps like this as well that slid out the back like that. And sometimes they're a pain in the butt to get out. There we go. Okay, let's see what we've got ourselves into. Um, Transformer codes, 831-1968, so yeah, late 60s, 10th um, week, 1968, 10th week over here as well. We do still have the original can capacitors. I don't know if they're hooked up. He said it might uh, need new capacitors, and that's true. That could be capacitor related. We'll probably go and replace those anyway if they haven't already been done. And they are indeed still hooked up. So, so yeah, we'll definitely replace those. We've got um, there's a little diode here. Uh, this is too rectified though so that diode is probably in the um, bias supply I would imagine so we'll check the we'll check the bias supply and that that could also be a culprit it could be that the bias is starting to run away uh, and it just doesn't run away completely um, where the tube won't conduct uh, until it's fully warmed up you know after a little while so that's that's something that could be going on as well pretty clean in here though Let's see, we have these Cera caps in here. These caps usually hold up pretty well. These are ceramic um, on the outside and they're kind of epoxied on the ends. So you got, they're they're pretty well sealed usually and, and don't, um, they don't succumb to atmospheric conditions or moisture like some other caps can. Um, you know, it, it could very well be, I'll test them you know, do some voltage measurements and things to make sure none of them were leaky. <clears throat> but um, I look for them to probably be pretty good. Radionic Company Incorporated on that one. American Radionic Company on that one. Same type, but just labeled differently. Probably would be wise to use grounded inputs there. And you'll also notice that uh, one side is going is going over here to this half of a 12AX7 and the other side is going here to this half of a 12AX7 so this 12AX7 is only really doing half duty which is unfortunate because you're kinda losing some gain there if he wants this thing rocked up I could easily rock this up by just cascading these gains and eliminating one of these <coughs> inputs I don't know why he would have done both inputs unless he just it, maybe he's using both inputs. I don't know. Um, I'll probably email him and ask him about that and see what he wants to do. Uh, looking over here on the speaker output, right there, we kind of have a similar situation where it's it's soldered okay, but not great. So um, I may clean that up a little bit. Just just kind of get that. Uh, get that on there a little better it's kinda of hard to see from the angle you're at but that's as far as I can go with this camera stand um, 
Yeah, so, you know, a couple things I can look at already, and I'm definitely going to check the bias supply and everything. So let's get the tubes in this, and then we'll kind of go from there. We'll start taking voltage measurements. Okay, here we get a look at the schematic for this thing, and we can see here uh, the microphone uh, inputs come in, each using a half of a 12AX7 uh, before going through a coupling capacitor and a small uh, little tone network here into a one meg pot. The signal comes out of this 12AX7 and goes through the uh, tone stack to this one meg uh, pot right here and then into the next stage where it comes out and then on to a 6AV6 which is being used as a, a phase inverter okay there's some feedback injected right here from the output transformer the output transformer has a dedicated winding on the secondary uh, for feedback by the look of it and it's fed back here into this point Okay, the bias supply is probably the first thing we're going to check. We're going to check all the components in this bias supply because I suspect if it's uh, if it's cutting out that it could have something to do with this supply. So we'll check and see see if there's negative 42 volts here at this point, and also check and see if there's about negative 38 volts at the grids of the output tubes. Uh, we'll check and see if there's around 440 volts on the plates, um, and that'll probably be about the first thing that we do here. So let's take some voltage measurements first of all. We'll fire this thing up on a load and uh, take these measurements and see where these voltages are. Alright, I have my leads uh, hooked up here getting ready to take some measurements uh, but instead of doing that um, let's play a game. Let's play spot the problem. Okay, I'm gonna start zooming in on something and you tell me when you've spotted the problem. You may have actually already spotted the problem and uh, I only just now spotted it, but uh, tell me when you spot the problem here. Okay. Getting warmer. Is it over here? No. Where's the problem? Where is it? you see that right there? <laughs> we have one, two, three connections that have never been soldered in this amplifier's life. One of them is rather important, in fact. Um, this bare wire right here, this is the cathode. This is the other cathode coming in on this black wire. So both these cathodes are supposed to be tied to ground, but they really are not they are looping around ground and then they're going up here to this resistor that's coming from the uh, one of the heaters it's coming from one side of the heaters and then this resistor is coming from the other side of the heaters that is kind of like a um, it's kind of like a false center tap uh, is what they've got going there you see the heater string here um, that 27 ohm and that 150 ohm resistor right there that are tied to ground uh, neither of those are actually tied to ground so it would not surprise me if this thing got some really intermittent uh, noise issues uh, especially if you sat this thing up on top of a cabinet or something and started rocking out with it you would probably get a lot of intermittent noise issues um, and just not to have the uh, whoops what happened there and by the way, this is a very extensive. Uh, this is a very extensive PDF manual <laughs> that uh, this guy sent me with this thing. Um, but see, you know, if your cathodes are not connected to ground, you're going to have major problems on your biasing as well. So, so yeah, totally. It does not surprise me that you would have some intermittent problems. That you would have some problems, perhaps even with the thing heating up, and then uh, you know, once it got nice and warm maybe things have expanded a little bit around that socket and you're no longer getting any kind of connection really or your connection is so intermittent and so loose that the bias is just running away so uh, and it's also not surprising that the tubes have been replaced also all of the tubes in fact the output tubes the 
uh, the uh, preamp tubes, the rectifier tube, all have been replaced with JJ tubes and maybe that was a, an effort to try to track down this problem that really has been this all along. So let's get some solder on this and this will also give me a chance to see how how well my new soldering station uh, will will do when soldering to a soldering to a chassis like this. So let's let let's let it warm up. And this soldering iron is already hot. All right, well, at least the stuff is connected now, so. And that did a reasonable job. Not as good as Big Bertha would have done, but reasonable. Okay, so, well, um, maybe we'll get lucky on this. Maybe that's all that was. Uh, and if we need to do some modifications, I can get with the customer on that and what he might want as modifications, but hopefully that solved the major issues, and uh, let's just see if it did. Uh, I've got a speaker plugged in over here on the desk. Uh, so we can so we can sort of check it out. Let's dial it up on the very act slowly. Okay, the amplifier's on. Let's give it a little bit of juice. Well, I'm starting to hear something at the output. I wonder if Okay, well that's interesting. I'm not getting really anything. There we go. Well, there's 25 volts right there. Why am I getting nothing there? Hmm. Well, let's check the plates. Uh, yeah, let's we'll check the plates then. Let's see what, what kind of voltage we have on the plates. Well, there we go. Finally, there's some voltage. Okay. Yeah, see, I should have negative 30 something odd volts right there. And I've got nothing. Why do I have nothing? First of all, let's check that resistor right there, and then we'll also check that diode. That resistor uh, is open, wide open. Well, there it went. Look at that. I just touch it, and then it starts. Let's go ahead and drain that capacitor. Just make sure it's drained all the way. So I'll just clip this on somewhere. You know, the diode seems okay, so I'm thinking it's this 47k resistor right here. That's the problem. Let's check this resistor again out of circuit, just out of curiosity. Yeah, it's measuring 54k out of circuit, so maybe that's not the issue after all. It could be, uh, it could be this capacitor is just gone. Uh, 456 microfarad is what it's measuring at. It's supposed to be 300 microfarad. 
So the value is way off. Um, could be that the value is getting skewed by just being still in circuit, but um, I kind of doubt it. I think our best bet here would probably be to replace that uh, replace that capacitor. We'll go ahead and replace this resistor. It's it's it has drifted. It's not uh, it's not bad though, like I thought. So that I don't think that was the culprit. It should have still at least worked, and it probably was working to some extent. But I just couldn't get any reading over here, so I'm not that, that, I'm a bit puzzled by that. Uh, once again, unless this uh, capacitor is bad, so we'll replace this capacitor, um, and I think I think that might um, might solve that issue. Now the good news is we have an extra terminal over here that's not being used by anything, so we can move all of this stuff over to here. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is try a 100 uh, microfarad capacitor in that spot rather than uh, a 300. A 300 is probably overkill and a bit unnecessary. 100 is fairly standard so I'm going to stick a 100 in and we'll see where that gets us. Alright, we are back with this Lafayette amplifier. It's been a couple days. Um, I have spoken to uh, the customer about it now and uh, let him know where we've gotten so far and some of the modifications uh, that I recommend and he's given me the green light to go ahead with a couple of modifications. Uh, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the second input. Um, because it's not a grounded input and because it will probably never be used anyway, it's not really doing this amp very many favors to be there. Really all it's doing is adding noise at the input. So getting rid of that is going to help. I'm going to uh, also ju internally jumper, uh, well the first stage, so that um, they are running in parallel and that way you'll be able to blend in uh, one side and the other together. Uh, the, another thing I'm going to do is um, probably bias each one slightly differently so that you can get a, a slightly different tone on each side so you'll be able to turn up um, microphone volume 2 and get a slightly different tone out of that channel than you would um, turning up microphone volume 1 and you'll also be able to turn both of them up and combine those and also the switch uh, the other plan that I had is this switch that's uh, up here. This is like a feedback killer switch. I think what we're going to do on this, we're going to uh, repurpose this switch to be a switch for the cathode bias uh, capacitor, or the, excuse me, the cathode bypass capacitor on one of these first stages. I haven't decided yet, but uh, what I'll probably do is make it so that it's switchable between like a Fender uh, Baseman uh, value and more something more like a Marshall uh, JMP. And, uh, you know, plans can change and they very well may, but that's where we're headed right now. Another modification I'm going to do is I'm going to move this standby switch uh, from this panel on the back and I'm gonna just connect the wires uh, directly directly to these wires and either shrink to them or I'll, I'll connect them directly here and and you know connect them down there uh, the reason for that is th there's really no reason to have these here on this rail like this because that's high voltage especially if you have to reach back here to, to hit the switch you know you, you could very easily accidentally hit that so um, just a dangerous thing to have that there here's the manual by the way um, and this auxiliary control that's on the faceplate that one right there uh, that you know you can turn the control one way to kind of turn up auxiliary one and you can turn it the other way to turn up auxiliary two well I think we'll eliminate that and instead make that a mid-range control so we'll have um, bass, treble, and then mid-range over here. I know it'll be kind of funky, but it'd be better than it'll be better having one mislabeled thing than um, trying to move the bass here and the mid-range there. Okay, uh, both sides of this uh, 12AX7, this V1 tube, are grid leak biased, um, and that's the purpose for these caps right here. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the cap off. I think this second input uh, and just move it over to here. Um, so we're going to leave this second stage uh, grid leak bias, so uh, it'll kind of have a different character, I believe, if we do that. 
Um, so we'll kind of leave that side alone and then on this other side we will make it cathode biased, uh, remove this, uh, replace it with a resistor, probably like a 47 or 68K resistor, um, and then you know obviously bias it and add that uh, bias uh, bypass capacitor switch. He said he was getting some intermittent activity on this channel and I think it was because um, this thing was this component was barely soldered in correctly so it was like I don't think it was getting a really good connection you could actually move it around I'm gonna leave this out of the way for the moment because we're gonna need some room here to uh, rewire this other stage but uh, first things first I do want to go ahead and remove I'll remove this jumper wire and also this capacitor because we're not going to need it. Alright, this is a schematic for uh, about a 1970 Marshall uh, 1987 Lead Mark II. Uh, if we look here at the input uh, on these amps, uh, you'll see it is uh, split. It's split off into two inputs. Uh, this one half right here is biased with an 820 ohm resistor and it has a 320 microfarad bypass capacitor and this is very much like uh, like a 5F6 or 5E6 uh, baseman so if we look back here at a baseman schematic you will see it's very similar it has an 820 and a 250 so that's pretty close so it's kind of in the same range uh, also you'll note the 68k input resistors here and the 1 meg uh, grid leak resistor um, but if we flip back over here uh, we also have those here 68k and 1 meg the only difference is the 250 to 320 but over here on the second half we have a 0.68 microfarad capacitor which is a smaller much smaller capacitor uh, and we have a 2.7k uh, resistor over here uh, Fender also did uh, buy us with a 2.7k resistor for some of their amps um, they never really used this um, uh, this bypass capacitor value. Uh, this is this is really kind of a particular to Marshall. They also use this same value in their later JMPs, uh, the 2204s, the 2203s, uh, JCM 800 series. Uh, so this is very JCM 800-ish on this side, and this is very Fender basement-ish on this side. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine these two ideas. Now there's going to be a, a pop associated with that switching so it might not be something you want to do kind of on the fly but I think this is going to give us a lot of versatility. Okay, I've got the switch wired up here. Um, over on this side we have the Marshall style um, JMP or JCM 800 and over on this side uh, we have the more Fender basement-ish uh, feel and I've gone ahead and labeled that Marshall so you know that it's uh, Marshall on Marshall off we've got uh, these internally jumpered so when you plug into this one you're actually going over through this capacitor into uh, this grid over here and then you're also going through this grid stopping resistor uh, to this grid here which is now of course cathode biased Okay, I'll test this thing out. We're just on channel one here with the uh, fender side. pop there. So that works pretty well. And uh, this channel also works.
Okay, I'm back, and I've been doing a lot of work on this thing. Just to summarize what has been done, I have eliminated the auxiliary inputs because essentially they were just adding noise. So I took away the uh, wires that were running uh, down here to the uh, potentiometer, which was here. I uh, replaced this potentiometer with a uh, 20K, which is closer in value to kind of a, a Marshall tone stack, and I've rewired the tone stack to sort of Marshall specs, uh, or you know, pretty close to it. Um, and I, when I say Marshall, I mean like JCM uh, 800 sort of specs. I just realized that the, uh, uh, the death cap was still in here, so we're gonna go ahead and clip that. No need for that to be there. Also, let's see, I uh, cleaned up some soldering on the output. This wire was uh, was run over here to the old common, and this was grounded just here to the chassis, so I've, I've grounded it here with this blue wire, and it runs over to here. Um, so this is ground, basically, and that was part of the standby switch, uh, which I have taken off of here and moved over to here. So I eliminated uh, the yellow wire that was running to here and I just took the one off of there and moved it over there. So we shouldn't get any more high voltage right here at this point. Of course I redid the bias circuit and uh, also did that solder which was never soldered correctly. Um, that seems to have stabilized the output and the bias is stable now. Um, added this terminal strip uh, to help complete the tone stack, the new tone stack. Um, let's see, what else? I think one more thing I might do here is add one uh, bright cap probably on uh, this side. This is not a straight up Marshall clone or anything of the sort. Uh, what I've done is I've just kind of painted with a broad brush and taken elements of uh, Fender stuff and Marshall stuff and kind of mixed it with what was already here. The, the one thing I really didn't have to do anything to was the uh, power capacitors, the electrolytics. Uh, the only one, I, the only electrolytic I changed was the one in the bias circuit. Okay, so there's a bright cap installed on channel one's volume pot. Uh, I actually experimented with putting one also across the leads of the master volume a moment ago and it was just kind of too much so I removed that uh, but I think I think this is going to kind of get us where we want to be uh, on this channel we'll see I might experiment with this value right now I've got it at a 500 pico but uh, we may come back and experiment with it one other thing I think I'm going to try here is um, this negative feedback that is coming off of this winding on the output uh, I'm going to try this without that feedback. So right here, uh, coming off of pin 3 on V2, uh, we have the 33K resistor, which is going to this winding, uh, which is, this is just a dedicated feedback uh, winding. So we're going to remove this uh, just temporarily and see what happens. Okay, I am going to go ahead and experiment with a presence control here. Uh, again, our our current uh, feedback resistor is a 33K. We're going to bypass that with a 10K. We're going to go come right off of this just temporarily. And if this works out, I will go ahead probably and bring it over to this terminal. But for now, I'm just going to tack it onto here. Okay, there's our 10K resistor. And now we're just gonna gator clip in some leads here. So we'll come off come off of that and we'll go to a we'll go to a 50k pot just for starters. And we'll see where that gets us. Let's check that out. I tried it without feedback um, a moment ago. And uh it was just nasty sounding, so. Well, 
it's definitely working. So if we want maximum cleans, we would leave that presence control all the way down and keep the feedback high. And crank up the master volume, put it on fender mode, reduce the mid-range, crank the bass a bit. Now of course this would be a hell of a lot less noisy when it's when it's actually inside the amp and I, I don't have all these leads running to and fro. Now if I want uh, full on Marshall, switch it to Marshall mode, I'll dial down the output just a bit. You know how I know it's gonna be cool? Because here comes the wife to tell me to stop. Three, two, hey. one. It's 1 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's pretty tolerant, but now it's really starting to piss me off. Starting to piss her off, you hear that? Yeah. That means it's that it's means it's badass. <laughs> <laughs> it means it's 1 a.m. All right, so our negative feedback slash presence control is installed, and there is the resistor. And follow the red wire up. And there is the pot for it, the 50K pot. And I've just basically taken out the second, uh, the second uh, input since we weren't going to use it anyway. And uh, yeah, this should serve us well. Okay, so it turns out I'm not through with this thing after all. I, um, Testing it out, uh, it sounds great, but you have to kind of dial the bass down a lot uh, to really get it to crunch up. And even then, it's still a bit flubby on the bottom end. I mean, just a hair flubby. And it's just not really ideal. I would like to be able to um, have a little more flexibility on the tone controls. There's a .022 uh, microfarad capacitor that's a coupling between the first stage and the the second stage. Before it gets to the potentiometer here, there's a in, in uh, parallel. There's a 470k resistor and a 470 picofarad capacitor in parallel. Uh, there's also a 0.001 microfarad bright cap. This arrangement is very similar to what we see in this amp already except uh, you have a, a 220k a resistor here and you have what I believe is a 270 pico uh, but I think what I'm going to start with is this 0.022 I'm going to change this capacitor first this coupling cap and see if that just brightens up the tone uh, that little bit of a smidgen the other thing about this amp uh, in front of me uh, that's different from the Marshall is that the Marshall has a cathode follower uh, 
as a driver for the tone stack. Uh, this amp does not have a cathode follower as a driver for the tone stack. And in order to preserve uh, the flexibility that I kind of wanted to achieve with the second channel, you know, remaining sort of stock, if I can't get to where I think this thing could be or needs to be, I may go back and revisit that and uh, possibly eliminate that second channel and just create a cathode follower by, you know, freeing up that second half of that first 12AX7 and then later on down the line I'll have a, a cathode follower available for the tone stack. Okay, I've made those changes to channel 1 uh, over here and made the change down here to a, a what is that, a point double oh one capacitor. I'm going to go ahead and add another bright cap here on this channel and I'm also going to go ahead and re-bias it as well. I'm not really happy with this channel. It's really kind of dark and uh, uninspiring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, I will bias it with a 2K and a 2.2 uh, microfarad bypass capacitor. Oh yeah, the cap that's coming out of it, I'm going to change that as well, probably to the same value as this one. Um, and then I might leave these to this uh, resistor and little capacitor instead of changing it to these values just for variation's sake I might uh, leave it at this okay I've got this second channel rewired um, and I feel really stupid but I didn't even have a uh, grid leak resistor for this uh, first channel at all before so I'm, I'm surprised it even sounded as decent as it did so I've added the, this one meg and this is common to both channels I did also change the uh, coupling capacitor into the next stage and left these two components and down here I added this uh, uh, this little bright cap so let's uh, let's fire it up and see what it does <laughs>
Yeah. Come here. Oh, God. Cut, cut this <laughs> off. I don't want to be on camera. She doesn't want to be on camera. <laughs> she's staying on camera. And she's getting tickled on camera. <laughs> Daddy. All right. Night, night, sweetie. I love you. <laughs> That is the uh, late 1960s Lafayette PA-645A, sort of half-assed converted into a Marshall uh, JCM 800. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you has, have, bleh, if you has, if you has, please hit subscribe. <laughs> if you have, please hit the subscribe button. And for now, y'all take care. <laughs>